many of you already know that last summer I picked up the Suzuki Samurai that was built on the show Extreme 4x4. I love this project and we're finally in a position where we can get started. I've only got like a day and a half or so to shoot this video, but I know that if I work super hard, we can get the old drivetrain torn out of this thing, at least the old axles and suspension and all that stuff. And hopefully we can set these Unimog axles up in a way that we can kind of get an idea of how things are gonna look once it's all said and done. For those of you that are fans of the show Extreme 4x4, today is a special day. We're resurrecting what I think is the coolest thing they ever built on that show. It's gone through many iterations even since that show, but now we're gonna put it on a set of Unimog portals. We're gonna throw it on a set of 39 stickies. We're gonna mount these to some bead locks. By the end of this episode, I'd like to have basically all the drivetrain out. We need to get started on the new drivetrain and hopefully we can have wheels mounted on beadlocks, mounted on our Unimogs and slid into place so we can kind of start to look and see how big of a difficulty it's gonna be to get these crazy huge Unimogs under something as small as a Samurai. <laughs> This Samurai has already got a set of upgraded axles, but they're not gonna be able to handle what we wanna do to them. These have fully built Toyota axles, which are great, especially for a lightweight vehicle like this one. But I wanna run minimum 39 stickies for rocks and stuff, and then I'd like to go all the way up to a 44 when I do snow. And I need to make sure that I have like maximum clearance, plus I like to play with weird stuff. So for that reason, we're gonna figure out a way to shoehorn a set of Unimog axles under this teeny tiny samurai. So that means pulling out all the old parts so I can get everything ready for all the new stuff. Pointer for those of you that are buying beadlocks for the first time, make sure you are buying beadlocks that have an accommodation machined for the hardware to countersink into on your ring. This is, this is huge when you go off road because there's still a whole lot of beadlock companies out there that are selling these to where they don't countersink the hardware. And I have physically watched people lose these bolts, meaning like <laughs> they've got the wheel pinned into a rock, they're having to really work their wheels in order to get up and over the obstacle. And they're just like machining down these bolt heads. And I've seen people lose five or six bolt heads all in one shot. I haven't seen one, seen anyone lose a whole ring before, but I know that it happens. And you can, I mean, you can get ahead of that by just buying a beadlock that gives you a space to countersink all your hardware. Now I got these, these are method bead, bead locks. I got these from Northridge 4x4. And many of you know that I have bead grips and I love the method bead grips. It's my favorite wheel of all time. I'm actually doing a video all about the bead grips right now. But the reason we're using bead locks in this instance and the reasons that the reason that I called Northridge to order bead locks instead of bead grips is because this is a full-time rock crawler. And this outer ring, not only is this a consumable part in my eyes, like let's think eight, 10 years of use down the road, this thing just keeps getting ground down and ground down and ground down. Eventually, if it gets bad enough, I can replace this. With a normal wheel, you can't do that. So I still think there's a place for bead locks, even though most of you, the overwhelming majority of you, I think the bead grips are by far the best solution out there. But since we're trailering this to the hardest trails in America and we're gonna constantly be putting this in harm's way, 
I think that having this really thick outer ring has huge benefits for us. Now, I'm going to empty all the water out of these 39 inch stickies and we're gonna start mounting all this up. This takes a lot of work and a lot of time, but I wanna get these mounted up so we can slap them on our Unimogs and see, uh, see how this looks with the Unimogs sitting in place and the tires underneath it. If you've never mounted bead locks at home, here's my process. Or maybe you've just done bead locks once or twice and you're curious on how other people do it. This is how I've found to be like the most efficient way to do this and make sure I don't have to come back and do anything later. The first thing that I do is I lubricate all of the different surfaces with some really soapy water. I'm talking like a quarter of this container is really cheap soap and then the rest of it is water. Then you've got to drive that inner bead past the outer bead and I usually just kind of muscle it in there. And then after that, I get it all set up on the table and I like to blow out every single thread hole, sometimes twice, just to make sure that you know one grain of sand stuck in one of these threads can ruin your day. It could be a really big deal. You're threading steel into aluminum so we've got to proceed with caution. The next thing I do is I put any seeds on every single bolt that's gonna get threaded in, and then I use the weakest impact that I have, well, the second weakest impact that I have to drive all of these bolts in in a star pattern. The star pattern is gonna make sure that everything is seating nice and evenly, and then I just do two full circles all the way around. And the reason that I do that is that whenever you tighten one bolt, it loosens the two next to them, and my impact, I figure, is somewhere between 15 and 17 foot-pounds, so it's, it's nice and weak, it's perfect for this job, and so I do two full circles. Then I whip out the torque wrench. I've seen bead locks require anywhere between 17 and 25 foot-pounds, a lot of people don't even torque them down. I just do it because it makes it to where in the future, I'm never worried about it. I know that we have even torque on every single one of these bolt heads and I don't have to come back and uh, make any changes later. So I'm gonna do two full circles with the torque wrench at 20 foot pounds all the way around. And then I pull the valve core, I set the wheel on the ground, I lubricate that inner bead one more time with some really soapy water. I set it on a bucket and then I air everything up. Usually I have zero issues. Sometimes you might have to push down on the outside of a tire just a little bit to make sure that inner bead contacts uh, the inside of your rim. Then once you, it reaches the right pressure, somewhere between 15 and 20 PSI, you should hear a pretty loud pop. Now the inner bead is seated. I can put the valve core back in and I'm ready to do the rest of them. I love what I'm seeing already. This is so rad. It's wide. We're gonna lengthen it out actually. I think I think we're gonna have to push that rear axle back and the front axle forward. This is gonna be a legit rock crawler, I'm telling you. And I know that it looks tall. It's not actually as tall as it looks. It's just a small body. I mean, look at it compared to where the TJ's sitting. It's, it's honestly not that crazy. Um, but keep in mind, we're building this for rocks. For rocks, you want that extra belly clearance. In fact, like 15, 20 years ago, everything you saw built for a serious trail rig was tall like this. Um, low center gravity builds are amazing for like Sand Hollow and Moab and stuff, and this is still gonna do great in those places, but I'm building this specifically for big rocks. We have crazy clearance underneath these portals. We're gonna have crazy belly clearance because Holy cow, do we have some packaging issues. But I think once we get it on the trail, this is gonna, you're really gonna see why this size, height, length, everything is gonna work so well. Be honest with me. Are you, right now, are you on Marketplace? Are you trying to find Unimog axles? I know there's some of you that are for sure. Before you go and spend harder money on something that looks 
uh, appearance is, is, you know, doesn't tell the whole story. It looks like there's just so many reasons to buy Unimogs. I think you should consider a whole bunch of other stuff because these Unimog axles are going to be very specific to what builds they make sense for. And so anyway, we'll start by saying what a Unimog is. It's these super rad off-road trucks that Mercedes built. And one day I want to build one. I think they're ultra rad and specifically the Unimog 404 is where these axles came out of. The 404, I believe, was like from 1955 to like 1983 or something like that. These had a tag on them, said that these are from a 1982. So this is a more modern 404 axle. Still, it's an axle from the 80s, right? Um, and then there's a bunch of different other generations of Unimogs. And Unimog people, feel free to correct me in the comments on any of this information, please. So pros. The gear ratio, this gets double gear reduction. So it's reduced in the third member and it's reduced on the hubs. Super rad for a guy like me that likes to crawl nice and slow. So our actual, our axle ratio is a 3.5, 4.5 to one. The hub is a 2.133 to one. And that gives us a 7.56 to one final reduction ratio, which is amazing to me. I, I'm so excited about that because I like to crawl slow. This is a pro for me, but a con for a lot of other people. If you like big V8 power, you like that snappy response, you wanna be able to just, you're not gonna get low, you want your gearing ratios to be lower than this for, for a lot of builds, right? Not, not all, I can't paint with that broad of a brush. But what I'm saying is that there are a lot of builds where this is just too low. And it's not like you can go to Yukon and get a replacement set, right? You can get some, you can get some slightly lower gear or some slightly higher gear ratios, but you're gonna be like trying to find that stuff from other Unimogs that came with other ratios and then put that third in. It's just gonna be a whole thing. So this is a pro for me, but possibly a con for you depending on the build. Strength, these are strong. I can run 42. Everything that I've seen online and everybody I've talked to said that I should be able to do a 42 without even batting an eye. This should be fine on a 42. I'm gonna do a 39 because I think a 39 sticky is a great tire. And they were they worked amazing on the TJ with a four nine inch and Dana 44. So we're lower gearing, more clearance. I think that this is gonna be fine for a summer tire. In the winter, I would like to, for snow, I'd like to find a set of 44s and uh, <laughs> This thing's gonna be rowdy on 44s. The price, I'm in this about $6,000. That's the price of the axles, machining, um, all the little parts and pieces. I bought brand new seal kits for every single seal and every gasket and everything for the front and rear axles from Mercedes. And the total cost for all that was 6K. Some people might think that that's a lot of money, but when you consider that these come with lockers front and rear, they're cable actuated lockers, when these come with low gearing when these are already strong enough for a 42, 6K is pretty dang good. And that's with the cost of machining to convert it over to like eight on 6.5 and disc brakes and convert the yokes and all that. So pretty good price really. Um, the size, 74 inches is what I measured from wheel mount surface to wheel mount surface. Um, it sounds like there's some big variations here. That's just what these measure out to be. Clearance, huge pro. The clearance is nuts. I haven't measured how it compares. I'll do that right now. I'll measure and see how that compares to our Toyota axles that we pulled out of here. On a 37 with the Toyota axle, I, want, I wanted a 39, which is why we're upgrading out of the Toyota axles because a lot of my Toyota friends said 39 reds or there, there will be moments where I can break them and I don't want that. <laughs> I want to be able to make sure that my rock tires are smaller than what the ceiling is of the axles that I'm using because I'm gonna beat this thing super hard. So for that reason, we upgraded out of the Toyota axles. I would guess that we gained four to five inches of ground clearance between going from a 37 to a 39 and going from a Toyota axle to a Unimog axle. I'll put that information in right now. I would bet it's, it's somewhere between four to five inches of extra clearance, which is a lot. Um, now, cons. <laughs> Parts. These are weird Mercedes military axles. I mean, do I need to say anything else? If you break in Moab, do you think you're going to be able to go get a new random bearing um, at the local parts store? Like, no. I mean, you've got to make sure that you're taking super good care of these if you want reliability. You've got to make sure that you're checking everything periodically and 
changing the fluids out. I mean, you've got oil in the center section, you have oil in the reduction boxes, you know, like th there's a lot of stuff to take care of. And finding parts is not, you're not gonna be able to go to the corner store and get parts for these. You're gonna have to get them online and order them. So parts is definitely a big con. Information. This is like the worst set of axles I've ever owned to try to find information for. Not only is the information all over the place, like just wheel mount surface to wheel mount surface measurements is all over the place. Uh, I can't even find reliable torque spec data. So if you are a Unimog person and you have a link of somewhere that can give me that information, please let me know in the comments. But there's, it's a bunch of weird military surplus axles. It, it, the information is not as easy to get as you know, axles from an F-350 or axles from a Toyota 4Runner or, or you know, mini truck or a Suzuki Samurai. So it's just more difficult to get the information you need to like own and use the axles, um, much less any repair information, you know what I mean? It's out there, it's just way harder to find and you have to really dig deep to get to the good info. Whereas it's a lot easier with like a Dana axle, for instance. The size, I think is a pro for us being a 74 inch wheel mount surface to wheel mount surface, but there's a lot of builds that these are just way too damn big, especially if you plan on driving it to the trail. You're not gonna trailer or anything like that. I mean, you're gonna need a lot of body to hide this so that you don't get pulled over by the highway patrol. So size is definitely a pro and a con. Two more cons to talk about. The third member makes these a nightmare to package. It's huge. It's gonna be an issue for us, I, but I know I can make it work. I've got a bunch of ideas to make all of these parts play nice together and a bunch of modifications that we're gonna do in the coming months to make all this stuff work and give us the clearance that we need. Now we could pull the thirds out, do a Ford nine inch center. Then you start adding a whole bunch of extra cost, custom shafts and all this stuff that negates part of the big reason to get these anyway, you know, which is that you can get out of the box untouched. You can get a super strong axle that you know, it's got stock lockers. I mean, the thing's great. So I don't want to do any of that. We're just going to, we modified what we have in order to make it work with what we have. Um, the last one is the machining. I already brought this up, but if you don't know someone that is capable enough to do the machining to convert this over to eight on 6.5 and to convert the yokes over to a 1350 or 1410, something common, then these are going to, they're going to sit in your yard. Let's just be real. Most of the ones I've seen on Craigslist and Facebook marketplace have been there, you know, a guy bought them, they started doing a conversion, they started grinding the brackets off or whatever, and then they started to see how hard it's gonna be to package in their vehicle, and they gave up, and now it's, you know, up for sale. So that's the list of pros and cons. Consider it, they're super rad if you can make them work. Um, if you can't make them work, look at other, uh, other options. There's a lot of other options out there that are way easier, um, and you could still have a really great set of drivetrain without having all this extra stuff that I'm going for. I know that this video is super information heavy. The next one is gonna be way more working, way less talking. We are going to start on the suspension right away. I've got a whole bunch of parts and pieces from Barnes Four Wheel Drive, and <laughs> I'm telling you, there are some big obstacles ahead of us in order to get this all to work together. But if we can get it all to play nice, this is gonna be the most epic thing that I've built to date. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you want to share with other people who watch this channel the different things that you're working on, use hashtag 4x4 build season. I'm gonna be using that because this is my 4x4 build season project this year, and I'd like to see what you're up to. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.